Thank you, Shamalia. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I actually grew up uh, in Wisconsin, so I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with this, but I've been in Florida now for about 34 years, and uh, uh, I went out this morning for just a little walk, and it was really beautiful, and I, I, I think that two weeks out of the year is fantastic. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about necrotizing enterocolitis, and uh, here's my disclosure slides. I have a slide I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, and over the next uh, 45 or so minutes, I'm going to talk about the definition of necrotizing enterocolitis, and can we focus on uh, something that we would consider to be a classic form of necrotizing enterocolitis. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, microecology of the gastrointestinal tract and how that relates to the uh, inflammatory mediators in the innate and the uh, adaptive immune system, and how this might relate to the uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we as uh, caretakers uh, for our babies might be doing that actually may be causing necrotizing enterocolitis, and then we'll touch a little bit on the future. So let's start with a couple of pictures here. Here's a uh, preterm baby, the type that we take care of a lot in our neonatal ICU, and several weeks later, this baby developed a very distended abdomen, and uh, this is very typical of necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, this is a disease that in North America affects about 5 to 7% of babies uh, uh, weighing less than 1,500 grams, and uh, about 20 to 30% of these babies who develop necrotizing enterocolitis die. Uh, it's a uh, terrible disease in terms of death, but also in terms of uh, morbidity. These babies, uh, if they have surgical necrotizing enterocolitis, uh, the large number of them, over 50%, have neurodevelop neurodevelopmental delays. It's a costly disease. It takes a lot of money to care for a baby with necrotizing enterocolitis. If a baby develops a short gut, it costs about $1.5 million to care for that baby in the first five years after birth. So this is a, a terrible, terrible disease that uh, over the last 50 or so years uh, we have recognized as being a major problem, but we have not seen very much problem, uh, much progress in this disease. Why? Well, one of the reasons is we've been lumping several diseases called necrotizing enterocolitis in the same data set. We still don't have a good definition for this disease. We have animal models that do not represent the disease that we see in human preterm infants, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And we have a narrow focus on individual pathways rather than systems-oriented approaches, and we'll talk about that a little bit also. So, more than one disease or more, or, uh, one disease with many different origins. The final outcome of necrotizing enterocolitis, if it uh, progresses, is intestinal necrosis. This is why it's called necrotizing enterocolitis. But we have babies who have uh, congenital heart disease. For example, interrupted aortic arch, hypoplastic left ventricle. Those babies develop an ischemic bowel. That's not the same disease that we see in preterm babies. In fact, this should not even be called necrotizing enterocolitis. This should have a different name. It should be called ischemic bowel disease or cardiogenic ischemic bowel disease. Then we have uh, uh, babies who have congenital anomalies of the bowel, such as Hirschsprung's disease, uh, various other congenital anomalies that could be mistaken for necrotizing enterocolitis. We have pro food protein insensitivity syndrome, and I'll touch upon that. And then we have the, what we consider the more classic form of the disease that is seen primarily in preterm infants, and we're beginning to think that we are honing in on the pathogenesis of this form of the disease, largely based on newer studies that we have on the microbial ecology of the gastrointestinal tract, and we'll talk about that. Lots of different forms of necrotizing enterocolitis, and this is one of our major problems is defining the disease. In the late 1970s, Dr. Martin Bell, a pediatric surgeon in Kansas, developed the scoring system for necrotizing enterocolitis. Three stages of NEC, stage one, stage two, and stage three. Well, we are still using these stages, and unfortunately, I think that these stages are, are not very helpful. Stage one usually consists of something like a distended abdomen, intolerance to enteral feedings, apnea and bradycardia. The baby is unstable. You may see a little bit of blood in the stool, but no definitive signs of necrotizing enterocolitis. 
Now that we're taking care of a lot of babies that weigh less than 750 grams, babies that are less than 27 weeks gestation, just about every single baby that we see at that gestational age has stage one necrotizing enterocolitis sometime in that baby's neonatal ICU career. It's a real problem. And if we record that as necrotizing enterocolitis, it can mistakenly be put into the data set as necrotizing enterocolitis. Stage two usually consists of what we consider to be medical necrotizing enterocolitis when a baby does not need surgery. You have some clinical signs, and then you have some radiographic signs. Later on, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, some of the other signs, sonographic signs. But the radiographic signs can be a little bit fuzzy, and uh, sometimes they can lead us astray, and I'll talk about that. Stage three is actually surgical disease, where you have free air in the radiograph. And this could signify intestinal necrosis or something else, spontaneous intestinal perforations. In the U.S., I don't know what the, uh, what the situation is here, but in the U.S., many of our pediatric surgeons, uh, if we have a baby in the first couple of weeks after birth, especially a very small baby, instead of doing a laparotomy, a drain is placed. And we never see if that baby has had necrosis of the bowel. And so many of these babies get recorded as having necrotizing enterocolitis. So in the data set, those babies get recorded as having necrotizing enterocolitis, and that could be faulty. So this is also a problem with the staging criteria. About 15 years ago, I had the opportunity to talk about necrotizing enterocolitis in Italy. And um, at the end of my talk, uh, this very tall, very stately-looking gentleman got up and said, we in Sweden never see necrotizing enterocolitis. What's wrong with you people in the United States? You see so much necrotizing enterocolitis. It was hard for me to answer that. I, you know, I said, well, maybe uh, we don't do as much breastfeeding. We've got a, a more heterogeneous population. Don't really know. But it was a very difficult question to answer. And you see this a lot. You see uh, different people from different neonatal ICUs saying, my incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis in my neonatal ICU is really low. But you have to look at this in perspective of the types of babies that you care for in your neonatal ICU. The incidence of NEC increases by 3% for every 250 gram decrement. NEC in babies between 1,200 and 1,500 grams is less than 1% but 500 to 750 grams is 9 to 12%. So let's take two different NICUs, NICU A and NICU B. NICU A sees 10 babies less than 750 grams per year, so that would equal about one baby with neck in that neonatal ICU. NICU B sees 50 babies less than 750 grams per year. That would yield five times as many babies with neck as NICU A. So it's very important. Of interest, is uh, after that meeting in Italy, I happened to uh, go to another conference a few months later, and there was a neonatology from Karolinska, and that neonatologist said, I don't know what to do in our neonatal ICU. We have six babies with neck in our unit in Stockholm right now. So you know, it depends on the time and who you talk to. So here's a, a picture of classic necrotizing enterocolitis. We have a baby with a distended abdomen, some, some peri-umbilical erythema, and uh, this baby uh, uh, obviously had something going wrong with it, and so we did a radiograph, and here you see this uh, linear pneumatosis intestinalis, okay? And here we see portal venous gas. This baby never showed signs of perforation, but it continued to get worse, and this baby was taken to the operating room, and here's what we saw. A piece of uh, bowel that was uh, uh, necrotic that was taken out, and fortunately, this baby did fairly well after the surgery. But this is uh, uh, what I would consider to be sort of the classic form of necrotizing enterocolitis. So let's uh, have a different scenario here. 29-week gestation preterm. The abdomen is soft. The baby is taking NG feeds well, but somebody did a radiograph of, the, uh, uh, of this baby, and here's what was seen. You see anything abnormal here? What about in this area? That looks a little fuzzy, doesn't it? Look, there might be a little bit of uh, air, okay? 
well, this baby's bowel was, uh, the abdomen was very soft, and uh, uh, we did CRP on the baby, and everything seemed to be fine, and we decided to feed the baby uh, uh, within 48 hours of, of seeing this sign. This all went away. And this probably was something that's not pneumatosis, but pupitosis, okay? Sometimes you will find that just stool in the bowel will cause this uh, kind of a pattern, okay? So that we can be led astray, and this is where the stage two necrotizing enterocolitis using the radiographs may be actually misleading. And uh, we'll hear a little bit later about uh, uh, the uh, uh, sonography findings that you may see. Here's another baby. This is a 25 week preterm, five days old, advancing enteral feedings of breast milk on hydrocortisone for hypotension and suddenly develops a distended abdomen. You see, this is obviously abnormal. This baby has a pneumoperitoneum. Baby was taken to surgery, and at surgery, this was seen in the ileum. What is this? SIP, spontaneous intestinal perforation. This is not necrotizing enterocolitis. This is a different disease entity. We can differentiate neck from SIP by clinical presentation. SIP usually occurs in the first week of life. Uh, may or may not be associated with feedings. Necrotizing enterocolitis usually occurs a little bit later, and I'll show you that the more premature the baby is, the later necrotizing enterocolitis occurs after birth in those babies. Um, you have abdominal distension in both. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, you generally uh, uh, will find that uh, this, uh, if you actually do the, uh, uh, the exams of this baby during surgery, it's a very, very different disease entity. So necrotizing enterocolitis and SIP are not the same thing. A little bit over, uh, uh, it's about eight months ago in a Journal of Pediatrics, uh, one of our postdoctoral fellows, a GI postdoctoral fellow and I, uh, published this uh, paper, Food Protein-Induced Enterocolitis Instead of Necrotizing Enterocolitis, a Neonatal Intensive Care Unit Series. And we took five babies, who had this uh, very interesting syndrome. All of them had uh, bloody stools, okay? Some of these babies were uh, uh, older in gestational age. They were not your typical 23, 24, 25 week gestation premature baby, but, but bloody stools. And uh, uh, we separated these babies out and uh, we uh, thought that these babies had something different than the usual necrotizing enterocolitis. This is very similar to what pediatricians will see in their offices in infants when an infant comes in at three, four, five months of age and has bloody stools. Some of these babies in the pediatrician's office may actually have radiographs taken and they can have pneumatosis intestinalis. And this is something called food protein intolerance enterocolitis syndrome. It's not a cow's milk allergy. There's no eosinophilia associated with this. It's a different disease entity we still don't have really good markers to differentiate this FPIs from typical necrotizing enterocolitis, but this certainly is something that I think can mimic necrotizing enterocolitis. So what causes what we would consider to be classic necrotizing enterocolitis? What is the pathophysiology? Well, there's some thought that genetics may play a role. If you have a set of identical twins in a neonatal ICU, and if one twin develops the disease, the other twin has a higher likelihood than the general population for also developing necrotizing enterocolitis. There have been some GWAS studies done looking at uh, uh, gene markers for necrotizing enterocolitis. I think that there have been some found that are suspicious, but nothing definitive yet. Immaturity of the gastrointestinal tract, as I mentioned before, plays a large role. The innate immune system is not very well developed. You have uh, uh, different uh, toll-like receptors, which I'll talk about, uh, that, uh, that develop differently and it may play a, a, a very important role. Motility, barrier dysfunction also may play a role. And the types of microbes that are present in the GI tract may also play a role. Now, if any of you were around in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and did neonatology, you, hear, you heard a lot about hypoxia ischemia as being a cause of necrotizing enterocolitis. Well, I mentioned before, you can have an ischemic bowel due to an interrupted aortic arch or cardiac disease. But what about our typical premature baby 
most of our premature babies who develop necrotizing enterocolitis do not develop it right after having very low APGAR scores. They develop it later on. This fact that uh, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, it was thought that hypoxia ischemia may play a role. This led to the development of a rodent model for necrotizing enterocolitis. And here's an example of how this rodent model works. You take some baby animals, put them into a plastic bag. You close up the plastic bag. You keep it closed for five to 10 minutes. These animals turn blue. They start to gasp. They're almost dead. And then you open up the plastic bag and you put these animals into a refrigerator and you cold stress them. Then you take them out of the refrigerator and then you gavage feed them. And you repeat this procedure over and over again. And guess what happens? These animals get sick and they also develop signs of intestinal necrosis. There are over 200 papers in PubMed using this model of necrotizing enterocolitis, using this as a model for necrotizing enterocolitis. Well, what do you think about this model? Does this fit what we see in our premature babies? What is the mean gestational age, corrected gestational age, at neck diagnosis? So here we have two babies. One is born at 23 weeks, the other is born at 29 weeks gestation. So the question we have is, when will this baby develop necrotizing enterocolitis, and when will this baby develop NEC? This has now been looked at in several studies, and this happens to be one that I did in uh, collaboration with Mohan Pami from uh, Baylor. And here we see the corrected gestational age in weeks at neck diagnosis, and on the y-axis we see the number of cases. And you see this peak between 29 and around 31 weeks corrected gestational age. So there's something that happens around that time that seems to predispose to necrotizing enterocolitis. What may be happening during that time? Well, one of the things is microvascular changes. We see microvascular changes in the eye at that time. We don't see retinopathy of prematurity prior to the development, uh, prior to around 30 weeks gestation. We start seeing it after that time. And so the same kind of microvascular changes may be taking place in the bowel. We know that the barrier is immature. There's a difference in the TLR developmental pattern, toll-like receptor developmental pattern. And David Hackham and Alan Walker and others have shown that around the late part of the second trimester of pregnancy is when the density of toll-like receptor 4 is the highest, and then it begins to decline. That leads to a very interesting scenario that I'll talk about shortly and also microbiota changes that occur at that period of time. We may be seeing a perfect storm right at that corrected gestational age, and we'll get to that shortly. Okay, so here we have some work that was done at Washington University uh, quite a few years ago, and the question that was raised here was, if you have rodents that are raised in a uh, uh, germ-free environment, what happens to the gut development? What happens to the microvasculature? Well, here's the normal development. Here is 14 days after birth in these rodents, and here's 28 days. And the green is the, uh, uh, the capillaries, the microvascular vasculature in the villi. And so you see from 14 days to 28 days this improved development in the microvasculature. Well, what happens if you have animals that are germ-free? At 10 days of age, this is what the microvascular vasculature looks like in a 10-day-old germ-free animal. If it's raised in a conventional environment, we see this, a lot more capillaries. And if you only have one microbe placed into the germ-free animals, this is Bacteroides theta iota omicron. Took me a long time to practice that. You see that the development is similar to that, what you see in the conventionalized. Situation. So these microbes are actually causing development of the gastrointestinal tract and the, uh, the uh, blood vessels in the gastrointestinal tract. What about the intestinal barrier? We only have one layer of epithelial cells that separates the outside of the body, and the outside of the body is actually in our gastrointestinal tract. The gastrointestinal lumen is actually the exterior of, a, of our body. And there are numerous microbes, 10 to the 12th microbes in our colon, 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th microbes per gram of intestinal material. So this single cell 
a single layer of cells with a little bit of mucus on top separates the inside of our bodies from these microbes. There are seven different types of epithelial cells or cells in the, uh, uh, in the intestinal epithelium. And several of these are very important. There are mucus producing cells and muc knockouts, knockouts of these uh, goblet cells actually lead to necrosis of the intestine. We have these cells at the very bottom of the crypt region called panic cells. These panic cells are strategically located right near the mitotic region of the intestine. So the mitotic region is right here in the crypt. And these panic cells produce defensive molecules that protect the, actively, the cells that are actively undergoing mitosis and proliferation. Uh, and if you did not have that protective effect, that could cause necrosis of the intestine. So here we have, again, the panic cells producing these defensive molecules, and these defensive molecules protect this uh, mitotic proliferative region of the gastrointestinal tract. What happens when you knock out these panic cells? This is work done by Steve McElroy, who's now the uh, chief of neonatology at Iowa. Uh, you see the intestine here. This is control intestine. And this is a chemical that specifically knocks out the panic cells. And you start seeing this change down here. And then if you also use Klebsiella, you don't see that much. But if the combination of this panic cell knockout and Klebsiella leads to what would be considered a necrotic bowel. So panic cells appear to be important. But is this really necrotizing enterocolitis as we see in preterm babies? Probably not the same uh, uh, mechanism. This is a very important paper that was published uh, in 2004 in Cell. And the title is Recognition of Commensal Microflora by Toll-like Receptors is Required for Intestinal Homeostasis. What they did in this uh, paper was, uh, in this uh, study at Yale University, they looked at wild-type animals, wild-type rodents, versus uh, uh, rodents who had knockouts of toll-like receptor 2, toll-like receptor 4, and a linking molecule called MYD88. And they found that the knockout animals, if they were exposed to a detergent-like material called DSS for a very short period of time, Within one week, those animals developed necrosis of the bowel, very bloody uh, uh, necrosis of the bowel, and they died. Then they took the wild-type animals, and they found that in the wild-type animals, if they took out all the microbes in the gastrointestinal tract, and these were not knockouts, but wild, uh, th these were uh, uh, just the wild-type animals getting four different types of antibiotics, those animals within one week developed hemorrhagic necrosis and also died. So here's a picture of this, and this was a commentary in the New England Journal of Medicine. Here's microbes in the gastrointestinal tract, the normal microbiota. Here's normal toll-like receptors. You treat these animals with this mild detergent-like material, and you get very good repair and homeostasis. But if you knock out the toll-like receptors, these animals die starting at around one week after this treatment if you have the toll-like receptors present, but if you wipe out all the microbes, then you have also intestinal necrosis within one week, okay? Showing the importance of the toll-like receptors and also the importance of the microbes. So the lesson from this study is that low-grade stimulation or tickling of toll-like receptors can prevent high-grade inflammation and intestinal damage and promotes intestinal homeostasis. Remember this, because we're going to talk more about this shortly. Now, in uh, the uh, early 1990s, late 1980s, the Human Genome Project was initiated. And with the Human Genome Project, uh, we were able to uh, find what, the, what we are made of in terms of our DNA sequence. Okay, in 2002, 2003, we had our human genome mapped out. But along with this human genome project and several billion dollars, we were also able to develop new technologies to look at microbial DNA. And 
Uh, here I'm going to show on this slide a couple of uh, different technologies that are utilized to evaluate microbial DNA. In the past, we only used culture-based, primarily used culture-based techniques. But now, with using these DNA-based technologies, where it opens up a whole new world in terms of telling us what kind of microbes may be present in a certain niche, uh, and also what these microbes do. So with 16S sampling, this is now relatively inexpensive. You can do a 96-well plate uh, with 16S for less than $1,000. And 16S looks at the uh, uh, sequence of microbes in the 1,500 nucleobase region. There are nine variable regions uh, of this 1,500 nucleobase uh, uh, 16S region that have uh, uh, variable uh, components. And if you chop them up and uh, uh, put them back together and uh, evaluate their sequences using computer-based bioinformatics, you can tell pretty much what bacteria are present. So you can say, I've got largely these taxa of bacteria present in my sample. But just naming the microbes may not be enough. You can also do whole genome sequencing, which is much more expensive, sometimes called metagenomics, much more expensive. That will also tell you what the microbes do. It not only will tell you what microbes are present, but it'll, it'll give you some functional idea of what these microbes are able to do. So that's very important. Okay. So utilizing some of these techniques, there are several groups that started to evaluate the microbial ecology prior to the development of necrotizing enterocolitis. Our group was one of them. We were fortunate enough to get a National Institutes of Health grant. And so what we did in three different hospitals in northern Florida, we collected poop samples from babies from 12, who weighed 1,250 grams or less. And we saved these, uh, put them in our freezer. And after a period of time, we were able to take out those samples of the babies who developed necrotizing enterocolitis, found some closely matched controls similar gestational age, similar time, same neonatal ICU, and then did the 16S sequencing. And here's what we found. Each one of these colors represents a different phyla of bacteria, okay? And here are the babies who developed necrotizing enterocolitis. You see this change in colors one week before the diagnosis and less than 72 hours of diagnosis. We see this increase in the purple, which is the proteobacteria, and a decrease in the red, which is the firmicutes. So this proteobacteria to firmicute ratio declined prior to the development of necrotizing enterocolitis. And here are the, our control babies. No real change. At the University of Chicago, Erica Claude and colleagues did very similar studies. And here's just from one of her papers. This is looking at a set of identical twins. This is a twin who developed necrotizing enterocolitis. And you see there's a shift of the firmicutes. Again, a decrease in this type of phylum of bacteria and an increase in the proteobacteria. Here's the other twin. No change in the bacteria prior to the development of necrotizing enterocolitis. Washington University, uh, Barbara Warner and colleagues looking at uh, um, the abundance of gamma proteobacteria. So here we see the uh, cases. These are the babies who developed necrotizing enterocolitis. This is over time. And you see this red increasing here? That's the proteobacteria. But here in the controls, they hardly increase at all. So it seems that there is a change in the microbiota prior to the development of necrotizing enterocolitis. About two years ago, uh, Mohan Pami from uh, uh, Baylor College of Medicine contacted me, and he asked, is it possible that we do a meta-analysis of the sequence data from the several different neonatal ICUs? And I just mentioned some of these neonatal ICUs to you, but at that time there were about eight or so neonatal ICUs that had done very similar studies. And so we contacted these different neonatal ICUs, and we were able to get the sequence data from Harvard, from uh, Cincinnati, from uh, Washington University, uh, from University of Florida, from various different places. And we put the sequence, the sequence data together. And the bioinformaticians at Baylor uh, looked at this. And here you see relative abundance of bacteria in the control babies over time. And here's the firmicutes and the uh, uh, proteobacteria. This is uh, and what we see here in the neck cases is a decrease in the firmicutes in the yellow and an 
increase in the proteobacteria, similar to what I just showed you in all the other studies. So this meta-analysis, putting all the sequence data together, showed the same thing. So here, looking at proteobacteria, we see an increase prior to the development of neck. Firmicutes, we see a decrease. And then there's this other smaller type of bacteria called the bacteroidetes. In the controls, we see a little bit of this yellow, the, the very light yellow, and in the cases, we see very little. So what does this mean? What do these bacteria do? So let's think about the proteobacteria first. These are largely gram-negative microorganisms that have high lipopolysaccharide concentrations in their cell wall. They constitute the E. coli, the Klebsiella, the Pseudomonas. And with this high LPS in their cell wall, if you have this increase that I mentioned to you before in the uh, TLR4 receptor, and you see this increase in the number of bacteria that have a lot of LPS in their cell wall, this seems to create a perfect storm for development of inflammatory response. Then we have the firmicutes. The firmicutes are gram-positive microorganisms that have a lot of lipotychoic acid in their cell wall, and they have relatively low LPS. These are considered to be the probiotic types of microorganisms. They also are very efficient in producing short-chain fatty acids such as acetate, butyrate, propionate. Butyrate is a very important short-chain fatty acid. It is the most important fuel for colonocytes. And it also is important in proliferation of epithelial cells and it helps form tight junctions between epithelial cells. So these are the good bacteria. These go down prior to the development of necrotizing enterocolitis as the propionobacteria go up. Then we see a, this third type, the uh, bacteroidetes, and uh, this is a gram-negative anaerobic rod-shaped bacteria, and they have high quantities of uh, polysaccharide A in their cell wall. At least uh, certain of these uh, species or uh, taxa of uh, bacteroidetes have uh, uh, this PSA in their cell wall. PSA actually stimulates the production of IL-10 and TGF-beta, which are anti-inflammatory mediators, okay? So remember, that's one that in the control babies you saw fairly decent levels, but in the neck babies you saw almost no, uh, none of this, uh, of these uh, bacteroidetes. We hear a lot about uh, toll-like receptor 4, and I know that uh, uh, my friend David Hackham would like us to think that this is the primary mechanism for the development of necrotizing enterocolitis. But I think we have to think, have a little bit more of a broad perspective, and we shouldn't all be in this uh, fishbowl of TLR4. We should uh, maybe think outside of this uh, a little bit more. Uh, there are many other potential pathophysiologic pathways. So uh, certainly toll-like receptors are important, but anti-inflammatory pathways such as IL-10, TGF-beta, uh, protective uh, TH17 cells, PANF cells might be important. VEGF mechanisms, as I mentioned before, the uh, microvasculature may be very important, ER stress and oxidative pathways. So it's very important that we realize that it's unlikely that we will find a treatment for this disease with only one, aiming at only one pathway. We need to think about the entire pathway. And as far as treatment is concerned, I don't think that we will ever be able to really treat necrotizing enterocolitis. We're gonna be able to prevent it, but not treat it, not, not easily. Okay, so what about in the neonatal ICU? Do common neonatal practices cause necrotizing enterocolitis? Here's a pogo cartoon that says, we have met the enemy and he is us. So I'm gonna talk about some of the uh, factors that we have in the neonatal ICU, things that we do that may actually predispose babies to the development of necrotizing enterocolitis. I'm gonna really focus on antibiotic or uh, uh, treatment, acid suppressor use, and also enteral feeding. What are we really doing? Antibiotic use. Intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis is provided in about 30% of pregnancies. The majority of preterms who are less than 33 weeks gestation are treated with ampicillin and genomycin for at least 48 hours. The average length of treatment of standard of care practice in preterm infants 
with ampicillin and genomycin or other antibiotics is between five to seven days. So how do these practices affect the developing microbiome, microbial metabolites, resistance factors, and neonatal disease? Well, here is a term called dysbiosis. And we can induce dysbiosis by the use of antibiotics. So here's the normal balanced microbial community with increased, with high species diversity, good TLR signaling, increased barrier function, good immune development and tolerance. If we treat with antibiotics, remember before I said that Yale study, they treated with four different antibiotics and within one week, even with toll-like receptors being present, they started to get this enterocolitis. Well, here we see antibiotics wiping out the microbes. And what does that do to the uh, uh, interaction with the immune system? What are the most commonly used drugs in the neonatal ICU? Here we see them at the very top of the list, ampicillin and genomycin. Almost all of our babies that weigh less than 1,250 grams or 32 weeks gestation or less get at least two days of ampicillin and genomycin. At least that's been the case in the past. I think that we're starting to slowly get away from that, but that has been the case in the past. We have at least three studies now that show this. The more days on antibiotics, the higher the odds ratio for development of necrotizing enterocolitis. So that if you have a baby who is on antibiotics for about seven days or so, that increases the odds of the development of necrotizing enterocolitis by 50%, according to this study. Now, what about giving antibiotics to mothers? Could this potentially have an effect? We have no really good data yet on necrotizing enterocolitis. But this is a paper that was published in Science uh, about two years ago that I think is highly pertinent. What they did in this study, they took pregnant germ-free mice and they colonized some of these pregnant germ-free mice with an E. coli called HA107. This is a strain that does not persist in the intestine. It only lasts for about five days. Then they compared the inoculated to non-inoculated offspring in terms of their intestinal innate immune system. So here we have different innate immune cells, absolute cell number, two different types of innate immune cells. This is days after birth. This is, not at the, uh, the, this is not in the fetus. This is days after birth in these rodents. And you see that in the control animals, you had this level of innate immunity. And when you gave the mothers these microbes, they actually had better innate immunity up to 60 days after birth. So the exposure to microbes in the mother actually seem to improve the innate immune development, okay? So wiping out the microbes in the gastrointestinal tract in a mom may not be the best thing. I'm not saying that we should never use antibiotics. I think we have a lot of good data that says that they're very important in certain situations, but we shouldn't throw them at these moms like water. So here's a quote from one of my colleague neonatologists. So I give a couple days of antibiotics to my preterm patients. What does it matter if I change the microbes in the GI tract since I could potentially be saving the baby's life by treating unrecognized early onset sepsis? Okay, what do a couple days of antibiotics do? Here's one study, and there's several studies now that uh, show this. This is the effects of ampicillin and genomycin within 48 hours after birth, uh, only giving it for 48 hours after birth. And so here we are looking at different taxa of bacteria at week four and week eight. So here's the controls, week four, week eight. Here are the treated. And you see the colors are different. So the microbes four weeks later and eight weeks later are still different with only two days of antibiotic treatment shortly after birth. We don't yet have a good feel for what this does to the interaction with the innate immune system and with the immune system of the gastrointestinal tract. But we do know that it does play, uh, 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 that the types of microbes do play a, a, a significant role. But the specific role, we still don't understand. We still have not fulfilled Koch's postulates with that. Gastric acid inhibition. This is a study from Italy, a multicenter trial. The title is Ranitidine is Associated with Infections, Necrotizing Enterocolitis, and Fatal Outcomes in Newborns. <laughs> 
Okay, so giving an H2 blocker is, in, is associated with an increase in necrotizing enterocolitis and late onset sepsis. Well, how does this work? We're not totally sure, but here's one potential mechanism. This is a paper that was published in JPGN in 2013, and here we they evaluated bacteria at a phylum level. Here's where the babies, were, where this particular baby was getting an IV H2 blocker, and you see the proteobacteria going very high and the firmicutes being very low. They stopped the H2 blocker. Proteobacteria dropped, firmicutes increased. The baby started having apnea and bradycardia again, and uh, because of this concept that reflux causes apnea and bradycardia, which is false for the most part, they decided to start this uh, uh, H2 blocker again. Proteobacteria goes back up, firmicutes goes back down. Okay, Very interesting relationship. Not proving anything yet, but an interesting association. What about enteral feedings? I know that prior to uh, about 15 years ago in the US, it was very common to not enterally feed a baby for a week, sometimes two weeks after birth. We had all kinds of excuses not to provide enteral feedings to these babies. Here's just some of them. Low APGAR scores, mechanical ventilation, CPAP, et cetera, vasoactive drugs are being used. Well, we're beginning to recognize that maybe this is a mistake. Here's a lady, Elsie Witteson, uh, from uh, UK, and she did a lot of interesting nutritional studies. And one of the things that she found over 60 years ago was that the suckled pig's duodenum gains 42% of its weight in the first 24 hours after birth. This does not happen if you are giving parenteral nutrients and not feeding the gastrointestinal tract. You have to have some food in the gastrointestinal tract for the gastrointestinal tract to grow. Food in the gastrointestinal tract does not only feed the cells of the epithelium, it also feeds the microbes of the gastrointestinal tract. And those microbes play a major role. So the types of carbohydrates that you give, the types of food that you give to those microbes may play a large role in terms of short-chain fatty acids, as I said before. This is a study that was done at the University of Michigan, and this was done in adult mice looking at the types of bacteria that you find in the gastrointestinal tract of these adult mice. So here's the uh, unfed TPN situation. Okay, no enteral feeding, and you see a lot of blue. What's this blue? Proteobacteria. The fed situation, a lot of red, firmicutes. Okay, again, interesting association. This is a study that was done at Harvard uh, by Cami Martin's group, and uh, uh, what they did, this was actually more of a uh, retrospective study. This was not prospectively randomized, but they looked at uh, babies who were fed early, prior to four days after birth, versus late, after four days after birth. And they looked at uh, uh, analysis of neonatal morbidities. And so here we see neck almost statistically different, but these other morbidities were very much higher in the late-fed babies. At two weeks after birth, they found much higher pro-inflammatory mediators in the bloodstream of the late-fed babies compared to the early-fed babies. Again, retrospective type of a study, not prospective, randomized, but an interesting relationship. So where are we going in the future? What about these x-rays here? Are these normal x-rays? Are these, these babies normal? Do you see pneumatosis intestinalis? Do you see perforation? No. So I'm sure that, uh, Yasser, this, is a, this might be an interesting set of babies for you to do your ultrasounds on, but we don't know if these babies have necrotizing enterocolitis. We don't see the classic signs. So we need to have better techniques and biomarkers. Here are some biomarkers that have been looked at. Intestinal fatty acid binding protein. This is uh, uh, something, this is a biomarker that you see from the breakdown of intestinal epithelial cells. Claudin-3 is a tight junction protein. Both of these can be measured in the urine, so you don't have to draw blood from babies. They can be measured in the urine. That's a good thing. Calprotectin can be measured in the stool. And if you look at these uh, uh, spe sensitivity, specificity, uh, area under the curve types of markers, these look pretty good. The problem with uh, 
some of these, uh, especially the calprotectin, is you have to get it from stool. Okay? Problem with stool is you can't ask a baby to poop. For you. You know, I want a sample. Baby's not going to necessarily do it for you. Okay? Claudin-3, intestinal fatty acid binding protein, might be a little bit better in that regard because you can get it from the blood or you can get it from the urine. The problem with the seven or eight studies that we have so far, you, looking at those markers, are that they were evaluated right around the time when, this, uh, the, when the, uh, uh, the baby was first suspected of having the disease. Okay? These studies were not done very early on and followed longitudinally prior to the development of necrotizing enterocolitis. So these may have some promise in the future, but we're not quite there yet. There's some studies that have been done in the Netherlands, and here's one early detection of necrotizing enterocolitis by fecal volatile organic compound analysis. This is something called the electronic nose, okay? So the way this electronic nose works is you take a poop sample and you volatilize it, and you put it under a, 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 a gas liquid a, a chromatography techniques, and it will tell you what kind of volatile uh, uh, materials emanate from that sample, okay? Certain volatile mat materials have been more associated with necrotizing enterocolitis than others. And so they've been doing this study in the Netherlands. It's a multi-centered trial, and the results, to my knowledge, are not yet out yet, are not yet out. But this is, keep your uh, um, eyes open for the results of that study. Probiotics, okay? Are we there yet? I, I know that, uh, uh, I, at least I've been told, and I found out last night that it's not totally standard of care in Canada to use probiotics, okay? There are some neonatal ICUs that are using them, some that are not. Um, in 2010, this uh, meta-analysis came out by Dr. Deshpani and colleagues from Melbourne. And in this uh, meta-analysis, they evaluated 10 different probiotics in 11 different centers. And if you look at these results, they look very striking. You have this here favoring treatment. Less death, less necrotizing enterocolitis with the use of probiotics. But remember, they used 10 different probiotics in this particular meta-analysis. There have been subsequent meta-analysis done showing similar findings. But in this particular meta-analysis, um, there was a commentary that said, is it, that asked, is it ethical to not use probiotics in preterm infants? Have you heard this before from some of your colleagues? I, I, I think you probably have. I, I've heard this a lot. So the uh, Journal of Pediatrics, uh, uh, after this particular article came out, the uh, uh, editors wanted me to uh, write a, a commentary on this, and so I wrote this uh, routine probiotics for premature infants. Let's be careful, and I outlined some of the, uh, the rationale behind that. And I'm not going to get into all the details, but in the U.S., the current status is that uh, uh, we do not have a single probiotic preparation that we consider to be safe and effective. Okay, it ha we, have not, we don't have a preparation anywhere in the world that has been subject to a clinical trial that is adequately powered to evaluate safety and efficacy for necrotizing enterocolitis. I'm talking about a single product, okay? So we don't know from studies one product that is safe or that is effective. In the U.S., here's the states that are using probiotics the most common. About 15% of the neonatal ICUs in the United States are using probiotics. But what probiotic are they using most commonly? Something called Culturel, Lactobacillus rhamnosus. Lactobacillus rhamnosus has never been shown to be effective in necrotizing enterocolitis. But why are we using that? Because we are thinking that all probiotics are the same. This is a real problem. Only one study so far has been done that has adequately powered to look at necrotizing enterocolitis. That was the Costello study from the UK. Showed no difference in necrotizing enterocolitis, sepsis, or any other outcomes.
Here's a study from Emory, and I remember very distinctly Ravi Patel, uh, one of their neonatologists, about six, seven years ago, saying, we have so much necrotizing enterocolitis in our neonatal ICU, we need to do something. So they started to use a probiotic called Turel. So recently, they evaluated the pre-probiotic use and the post-probiotic use. So here we see from Emory University, necrotizing enterocolitis, pre-implementation, 12%. Post-implementation, 21%. So they actually increased their necrotizing enterocolitis rate. In Europe, using a different probiotic, also an increase in necrotizing enterocolitis. Not, this is not a, uh, a study that uh, did, was uh, randomized controlled, but they saw an increase. This is, again, something that I hear. Is it ethical to not tell parents about probiotics in the prevention of neck and preterm infants? I think it's totally ethical not to tell them because we still have a ways to go with probiotic studies. Human milk. We do know that human milk appears to be protective against necrotizing enterocolitis. In the past, we've been concerned that human milk has pathogens. And if you cultured human milk samples in the past, if you found staph, you'd throw it away. But we're beginning to recognize that these bacteria in human milk may actually play a big role. I know Megan Azad, who's here, at the, has done some very, very nice work in that area. And I think she's very, very much in the forefront of uh, looking at the microbes in uh, human milk. But there are large quantities of microbes in human milk. They're alive. If you pasteurize the human milk, you kill the microbes, okay? So donor milk does not have the microbes present, but baby's own mother's milk does have these microbes present. So if you assume from studies that we have an intake of 800 milliliters a day with an average number of microbes, bacteria, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth per milliliter, you are providing 10 to the seventh to 10 to the eighth bacterial cells which may actually be personalized to these babies by giving a full enteral feed from the baby's own mother's milk. So you're giving microbes by giving the baby's own mother's milk. So I'd like to summarize here and just mention a little bit about the future. Neck pathogenesis is multifactorial. Even if we invoke a classic neck, we need better definitions. Treatment of neck once the disease occurs is extremely difficult. We need to prevent it. The intestinal microbial environment, along with developmental aspects of the GI tract, are key in understanding the pathogenesis of classic neck. We need to have better systems, enteroids, and animal models to evaluate mechanisms that fulfill criteria for causality derived from some of these associative studies that we've had in the past. Once we have a clear understanding of the causes of the different forms of neck, we can target preventative strategies to these different forms of neck. Thank you for your attention. We have a little bit of time for questions, Dr. Oh, no, that was a fantastic talk. And it's very clear you're such a uh, well-known teacher of uh, in the Hippocrates Institute and in your graduate students, you've taken a very complex topic, broken it down, and make it possible for all of us to understand it. Thank you so very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, very uh, uh, clear presentation. Uh, regarding the change in the microbiome, 72 hours before the onset of neck, uh, why is that happening? Is that a cause for neck, or is it just a consequence of maybe an inflammation that is already promoting that change in the microbiome? That, that's a really good question. I don't think we know the answer to that. Uh, certainly there could be something else going on. But one of the things that we noticed in the uh, 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 multi-center, the meta-analysis that we did was that there was a, uh, that those babies who developed this change in the microbiota, uh, that those are the babies who were getting the greater quantity of antibiotics. Okay, there was a trend toward this greater use of antibiotics in those kids. So uh, I think that antibiotics may be playing a role, but we, we still have a lot of work to do in that area. And your, your question is well taken, yeah. Before we lose our links, are there any questions from link sites? We might have lost our people as well. But I think there might be one question. Um, anybody who has questions here, do come up to the mic. Uh, 
I do have a question for you while yeah. we're waiting for people to come to the mic. I was wondering, with you talked about uh, the tickling of the TLR receptor system, and do probiotics serve the function of tickling? Are we tickling enough? And do they actually change the microbiome when you give a baby probiotics? So uh, that still, I, I think we still have some work to do in that area. Uh, uh, there have been some studies suggesting that we really don't change the microbiome very much by giving probiotics, uh, but it depends on what probiotic you give. And I, I, you know, again, this is uh, very much dependent on how much you're giving, if you're giving it at the same time. Uh, th th there's a lot of issues that still have to be evaluated. So I, I don't think I can give you a, a really good straight answer for that. But tickling the, uh, the toll-like receptors, uh, so if you're looking at for tickling the toll-like receptors, you probably need more of the gram-negative microorganisms rather than the gram-positives. One of the things with the gram-positives, uh, the, 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 the classic, uh, you know, firmicute type of uh, bacteria are that they affect the metabolome, the short-chain fatty acids. And so I think that that may be the pathway rather than the toll pathway that may be protective, if it is protective. Can I ask? Okay. We introduced some protein, like extra protein to add calories to the, to the baby's milk, right? And I'm sure that you probably do in your facility. So how does that change the baby's normal flora? Like, w would that be one of the causes that you guys attribute to neck? Or, and is it a problem? How, how are you guys doing with this as well? Yeah, so uh, again, this is one of those questions that I, I don't have a, a, a really good answer for, but we have been doing some studies evaluating in an, an individual babies what happens you know, once you start antibiotics, when you stop antibiotics, if you introduce uh, donor milk versus baby's own mother's milk, and then later on uh, when you start introducing formula, and uh, when you introduce a uh, uh, human milk fortifier, which is what you're talking about, and there are changes in the microbes. Okay, yes, there are changes in the microbes. We, we have, we've, we've seen that, we have not yet published this, uh, but this is something that we do see changes in the, in the microbiota. So. Uh, what that means, again, I, I, we've got the names of the microbes. We're also doing metabolomics uh, concurrently with the uh, microbiome studies and also looking at inflammatory mediators in the stool. So we haven't put that all together yet, but probably within the next few weeks, <laughs> we're going to be able to analyze you know, that multi-omic data and try to put this all together into uh, the coherent type of picture that you're asking here. Can I ask you when you guys when do you start to introduce your um, human milk fortifier? To your we actually babies? start fairly early yeah. uh, at when the babies are about 50, 60 percent of uh, full enteral feedings, not at the very get go. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Hi, Shamala. Hi. Uh, excellent presentation. As always, this is not my first time to uh, listen to your presentation. Uh, one particular slide that uh, I'm really interested in is uh, mean gestation age at the neck diagnosis. The highest number is at uh, 31 weeks. So my question really is, is there any differences in terms of different gestational age babies? response to the TRR4 expression or bad bacteria or good bacteria response? So uh, this is, uh, uh, we don't have the answer to that, to, to, to you know, make it very uh, uh, concise for you. No, we don't have the answer to that. Uh, the problem with uh, evaluating human samples is very, very, Hi, it's a, it's a terrible problem. You can try to evaluate this in uh, animal samples, and that's what uh, Dr. Hackham and colleagues have been doing. But again, the, uh, the animal samples are not the same as what you see in, uh, in humans, that the timing of the toll-like receptor uh, development is a little bit different. And in humans, if you take tissue uh, 
from a baby who you think may have had necrotizing enterocolitis, that's usually very damaged tissue, and you can never tell uh, if that was uh, something that uh, was predisposing to neck or if it was a result of the, of the uh, necro necrotic process. So, unfortunately, we don't have that. Then what's the, your best guess? Why 31 weeker has the highest uh, number of neck? Combination. Not the 23 weeks. I, I think that uh, the factors that I mentioned before uh, that relate to uh, development of the innate immune system, pro and again, this is conjecture, uh, where you have the uh, uh, increased development of the toll like receptors during that period of time, where you have uh, uh, the development of a certain type of microbes, uh, spe specifically the proteobacteria, you know, high number of gram negatives with high amount of LPS in the cell wall, uh, where you have a decrease in the firmicutes, where you are not able to produce the uh, short chain fatty acids such as uh, butyrate, propionate, and acetate, which are all very important. Um, I think that those are all factors. And also, some of the things that we do to the babies during that time, like giving the, uh, uh, the antibiotics, which actually cause a dysbiosis. So I, I think that those are factors that contribute to sort of a perfect storm that happened around that period of time. And I think mm -hmm. that uh, the microvasculature in the VEGF system probably also plays an important role. That is still understudied. Thank you. Thank you for a fantastic presentation and uh, really a lot of food for thought.